Good evening. My name is Steve Finger, and we'd like to welcome you to another exciting episode of Hard Fire, New York's libertarian TV show, New York's premier libertarian TV show. Uh, tonight we have with us uh, Mr. Mark Axon. Mark is a partner in a midtown law firm specializing in real estate development and commercial litigation. Mr. Axon has been a member of the National and New York Libertarian Party since 1991 and has served as the, as the secretary treasurer of the Manhattan LP since January 2006. We also have Ron Wick, who is well known to uh, viewers of the Hot Fire show as a frequent guest and host. Uh, and Ron is also a contributor to American Thinker magazine. Uh, we've got a very exciting episode tonight for you in the wake of the terrorist incidents that we all are aware of, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, two topics, the Military Commissions Act and the Patriot Act. Um, as we all know, the Military Commissions Act was just passed last October, and the purpose of which was to try unlawful enemy combatants as defined by the administration and its representatives. And the significance of the Military Commissions Act is that it set up military commissions which operate frequently uh, under rules which are very different from usual court martials and civil courts. And there we have some uh, two guests who disagree somewhat as to the validity of this. Uh, Ron, I know that you believe that the Military Commissions Act serves a very useful purpose here. And uh, I was wondering if you'd like to say a few words about, uh, about the importance of the Military Commissions Act. Well, First, we have to establish a framework. Uh, the Military Commissions Act serves a useful purpose if we can agree that we're involved in a war. If uh, the attacks, the jihadist attacks of September 11, 2001 constitute a military action, if they constitute an attack on the American homeland, then we are on a wartime footing. If uh, you want to view international terrorists as mere criminals, then they should receive the protections of the criminal justice system. I think this is flawed reasoning. Um, I should issue a disclaimer right now that I'm no authority on constitutional law. My, my own thinking on the subject has been um, influenced heavily by uh, the writings of Richard Posner. I'd like to recommend his most recent book, not a suicide pact, the Constitution in a time of national emergency. Again, I don't like to sit up here and pontificate because uh, I don't have a, a law degree. Uh, we will talk about the ramifications of the Military Commissions Act as it affects personal liberty in this country. So in other words, to sum up what you believe, Ron, is that we're dealing with not ordinary criminals. We're dealing in a, in a pseudo war. And so we have to approach the problem differently from the criminal, from the way we, we would approach a, a, a criminal problem. And in some instances, different rules would apply. That's correct. If, if we were to be very specific, the people who fall under the jurisdiction of military tribunals should be referred to as unlawful combatants. Mm -hmm. Unlawful enemy combatants. Yes. Okay, which has been defined as, uh, as combatants or engaged in supporting hostil engaged in or supporting hostilities uh, when they're not lawful enemy combatants. Uh, Mark, do you do you agree with Ron's basic premise that uh, we should view our fight against terrorism as a war, and that in some instances we should be willing to bend some of the traditional criminal law protections in order to fight these these criminals? Steve, um, that's actually, that last part is where we mostly disagree, and that is bending the rules. The rules that the United States run by are very, very important. The United States should be the exemplar to which every other country looks up to. We should be the moral fiber for this world. We should not be bending the rules in order to permit all sorts of uh, tactics which we would never permit in the United States courts with United States citizens to go on. And uh, these include things like holding people indefinitely without charging them with a crime. I have no problem with charging somebody with a crime, prosecuting them, and should they be found guilty of that crime, having them serve time. But we are authorizing the executive to claim whoever the executive deems to be an enemy combatant 
throw him in jail, not charge him with anything. The, uh, Jose Padilla is a good example of someone who was held for three years without being charged. And this is, this is someone who is a United States citizen. Mm -hmm. Claim the, under the current uh, definition, if the president or his authority, anyone who he feels is a terror threat, that person can be held, and the conditions under which they're being held are really, truly heinous. Mm -hmm. Under the current situation with the Military Commissions Act, you have people who do not have the right to challenge their, uh, uh, their internment in any manner whatsoever. They don't have the right of habeas corpus, which mm -hmm. is a legal term, which basically is the right to bring the body to the court, the right to go to court. They don't have the right to be uh, heard in a federal court, a fair tribunal. Um, uh, Senator Specter described this as turning the clock back 800 years on mm -hmm. Anglo-American jurisprudence. Okay, so would it be fair that we to say that as a point of difference between you two, Ron, you feel that the present situation is so grave that it justifies uh, going beyond criminal protections and that these criminal protections do not necessarily apply to non-citizens. And I, that, uh, Mark, you believe that the, that the same protections that we afford in American courts to American citizens should be, should be extended to anybody with whom the United States is involved in a conflict as, as a moral, uh, that we are, as, as moral exemplars that we should do unto them the same thing that we do to our, our citizens, that they should, we should extend the same protections to foreigners that we do to American Steve, citizens. It's not, it's not just a moral argument, although the, a mor the moral principles are important, but what is the power of mm -hmm. the United States government? The United States go the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, act as a per means of limiting the government right. from doing things that that a authoritarian government might do. If we give the government the power to torture people, mm -hmm. the power to put people in jail and have sensory deprivation, stress positions, uh, public humiliation, dogs uh, attacking them, if we give the government that power, then what's to stop them from using that same power against us? And we say, oh, well, it's only against foreigners. It's only against people who we think might have contributed to something which might be part of al-Qaeda, maybe, because the guy might have been in Pakistan on that day. The point of the Bill of Rights, the point of the Constitution is to restrain the government mm -hmm. from doing things. And as soon as you give government the power to do these things, what's to stop them from turning it on us? Mm -hmm. This week, we're, we're, we don't like uh, Muslims from a particular region in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But what's this, and, and, and 50 years ago, we, we interned the Japanese. And uh, 150 years ago, uh, Negroes did not have uh, the right of habeas corpus. In fact, that's what Dred Scott held. The Dred Scott case held that, that, that a Negro man is not a citizen, and therefore he cannot avail himself property, of, the federal, right. of the federal courts. Right. What's to stop the government from continuing to enlarging that definition right. and start using that so power So basically your, your premise is that we should bind the government uh, as strictly as we can because they may otherwise use their powers incorrectly arrest against the rest of us. Is that, uh, is so, that do, you, do you believe that we should, we, should, we should bend it all in any way, that we should treat every citizen of the world, every citizen of the world, uh, in the same way that we treat every citizen of America. Of course Should we make not. A, distinguish, a distinction between the two, or do we have to extend the same protections to anybody involved in hostilities with the United States? Do we have to treat them and give them the same rights as we would an American citizen? Is that, is that what you're saying? Is that your point? They don't have the same rights, and I'm going to let Ron speak, but um, I will say this. Others, other people don't have the same rights. There's a certain penalty of rights that come with citizenship. No question I about mean, this, it. As but applies you, to the criminal you, justice system. Should we give the same, should, should, should foreigners be tried in courts where they have exactly the same rights that American citizens have in courts? If they're being held by the United States government in United States government facilities, even, then yes. Irrespective of what they've done, even if they've been involved in hostilities with the United States. I just want to get your point, because I think Ron differs, so once we clarify your yeah. point, then he can give the That is my point, and I let Ron they speak. They should have the same thing. Okay. I let Ron speak to his yeah. point, but my point basically is that if we are going to hold people in jail, then we should then give we them the same rights as American citizens? Absolutely. Okay. Ron, do you agree with that? No. 
No, and I, I don't think that most legal thinkers do agree with that. Uh, the distinctions here are clear. There are citizens who are entitled to the protections afforded by the American criminal justice system. There are combatants, legal combatants, who represent the nations. They are prisoners of war. Prisoners of war are entitled by Geneva treaties Convention. that uh, we, are, uh, we are signatories to, by the Geneva Convention protocols, to humane treatment. We mm -hmm. all understand that. Now, what are terrorists? Um, Posner, for example, says, well, they are sui generis. They are neither criminals nor combatants. They are something in between. They're in that shadowy area. They are fighting against a state. They are not committing isolated crimes. They have a political purpose behind their activities. Now, since they deliberately target citizens of, of a nation as opposed to soldiers of a nation, since they target civilians, men, women, and children going about daily activities, they break all the conventions of warfare. They are not entitled to the considerations given to lawful combatants. Well, wait a second. Would you say that during World War II, bombers, bomber pilots <coughs> were bombing cities, Germans that were bombing London, American pilots that were bombing Dresden would not be entitled to the same protection no, of the Geneva Convention? No, because they're wearing the uniform of their country. That's, that, that's uh, so it's not the act. It's The, the it's Geneva the, it's Protocol the specify that very clearly, that one of the conditions for a lawful combatant is that he be identified, that he carry a sign. Now, those so it isn't it isn't the attacking civilians, that's the point. It's attacking it's not civilians a, and, is, and, and also being not identified as, it, as a member of It's not the act of war. Okay. that makes you an unlawful combatant. It's the it's way you carry out as that. A, uh, it's, it's targeting civilians in particular. I mean, we're not talking about bombing uh, a military. Done. That was done. But it's, you know, it, it, the rationale is that it's a military target that's being hit. Yes, right. civilians are killed, and that's unfortunate. I mean, look. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not military targets, The, the, purpo the purpose of, of <coughs> bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki were to was to end World War II. I mean, the alternative was to launch a full-scale amphibious invasion of the Japanese homeland. The purpose yeah. of the Taliban is to end us. <laughs> yes, but the, so. my, my point is that the, the Geneva Protocols have been amended in recent years to take into consideration uh, guerrilla wars, these so-called wars of liberation. So they've allowed a certain amount of flexibility for uh, farmer fighters who don't wear uniforms. But even here, the Geneva Protocols are very, very specific about wanton killing, about killing women and children, about bombing a marketplace. You know, this, this places you outside the, the pale. These people should not be accorded they are not, the same protections. That, they should that not be accorded the protections uh, afforded to a lawful combatant to a prisoner of war. Okay. And they don't enjoy okay. prisoner of war Let me state. just ask you, you know, there are just, did I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's I just all right. wanted to get into some of the specific things. Um, the Military Commissions Act, sets up military commissions which operate in some cases in manners different from civilian courts and from court marshals. And, and one or two of the things that have been um, uh, pointed out, believed by civil libertarians to be especially egregious, is the admission of hearsay, hearsay evidence. Yes. Hearsay for our viewers means, uh, means that, the, that the individual making the statement is not available for cross-examination. In other words, uh, you can stand on the, uh, uh, the witness can say, I heard Joe say that Bill is a criminal, and he can't be really cross-examined because if he's cross-examined and, and they try to, to test the veracity, his only answer is that uh, Bill told me. I don't know if it's true or not. That's why we don't permit hearsay. It's sort of a, it's almost slander because the, you're not able to examine the person making the statement. Now, in the Military Commissions Act, this sort of thing is, is permitted. Would you, would you agree that this should be that would you hearsay evidence should be admitted, or is this one of the one of the things that you feel is outside the beyond the, the pale should not be? Should not no, be hearsay evidence in a military tribunal is very important uh, for for a fairly obvious reason. Um, the uh, Libyan terrorist Abdel Bassett, who was uh, responsible for the bombing of uh, Pan Am Flight 103. Uh, one of the damning indictments of Bassett was provided by the testimony of a Maltese shopkeeper who sold him some clothing that uh, fit into the suitcase. Uh, Bassett apparently uh, put the bomb inside a portable radio or something. This shopkeeper provided leads 
two American intelligence services that enabled us to link Libya to the bombing of, of Pan Am no, Flight 103. But that's, no, we're not talking about that. That's not hearsay. If, yeah, I, if that, I may, Steve. Yeah. Um, because the problem, hearsay in of itself is admissible. But under, is it admissible? Is admissible. It's admissible in, in a regular federal court, too. The problem is that in under the Military Commissions Act, you can uh, indict and you can convict solely on hearsay. Or even worse, you can convict solely on a coerced confession. And that's really the problem of who are the people who are down there, these so-called uh, enemy combatants. Um, usually, there's somebody who was ratted on by a bounty hunter or to a bounty hunter. Some, uh, there's cases in Afghanistan where people were paid $5,000 and you know they didn't like this guy and $5,000 is more money than they would make in, in 10 years. So what they did was they ratted out this, this very nice gentleman to my left, the, uh, to the bounty hunter, they got the $5,000 and now he's thrown in the brig. He just happened to be in the wrong place. He's not permitted counsel. He's not, he's being tortured, he's being denied the right to go to court, he's being kept in, in isolation. You've got very devout Muslim men who were, uh, who were uh, put in uh, very uh, questionable circumstances and were humiliated publicly. And this is purely, purely tactics to get them to confess. At that point, they're going to confess to anything. And now, under the Military Commissions Act, they can be convicted based on that coerced confession or based upon solely upon hearsay evidence. Hearsay is admissible in our federal court system, but you can't convict somebody solely on hearsay in a federal court, but you can under this Military Commissions Act. Another point is the Military Commissions Act was passed after the United States Supreme Court ruled that the military tribunals, which had been in place, violated the Geneva Conventions. Exactly the same thing that Ron was talking about, that he says only should apply to legitimate enemy combatants and not to illegitimate enemy combatants. Do you disagree with that? I disagree that it should only apply. I mean, if we are being Ron says that it should be applied only to legal. I, on, on I, you I, say I disagree. No, I think that should be the Geneva Convention should be applied to everybody. The United States if we, are, if we agree to the Geneva Convention, we are held to a certain standard. We should not be rounding up people and throwing them in jail and refusing to charge them with anything, refusing to give them access to a, to a lawyer. The uh, Center for Constitutional Rights has spent years trying to just basically interview mm -hmm. the guys down in Guantanamo. Uh, the, and there, there are people there who were tortured by the CIA and who they will not permit to even talk to a lawyer because if they tell the lawyer what happened then the CIA will be under indictment for what happened and that will infringe upon national security or some such hogwash whatever the Bush administration puts out this week. You're, you're, making, you're saying that, that there's torture going on in Guantanamo. All right, but there is no evidence of that. And the, I, I was going to ask, what, would you like to this, this is a, substantiate that? This is a canard that the, <clears throat> that the left in particular has used. Uh, mm -hmm. The International Red Cross has inspected Guantanamo many times. Mm -hmm. They have found nothing that rises to the level of torture. You know, uh, Saddam's sons, Uday and Kuse, specialized in torture. Uh, no one has found evidence of torture at Guantanamo. I'm not saying it's a place I'd like to be. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, prisoners would not rather be home. But are they being uh, fed? Yes, they are. Uh, okay. Are they, are they being they, attacked with dogs? Are they no, being not, forced to be in, in positions? No, they're that, not. There are lawyers from no, the Center for Constitutional Rights who have just come back there. I, I just last month listened to a, a young woman who's a paralegal at, at CCR who went there for fi with five people. One of the fellows who was there, his son, he, was a, he was in Pakistan. He wanted his children to have a devout uh, Muslim education. He got rounded up somehow, caught in there, and he was, uh, he, uh, a woman's menstrual blood was draped in front of him. He was exposed to things that would be offensive, be offensive to, to us, and certainly what was offensive to What is the evidence the that any of this is actually happening? I don't know. I mean, These people are telling their lawyers it happened, and, well, and Ron we, is denying that it did. No, no, no. Whether or not it did or not, I don't know. I only know what we the know lawyers are that telling us. We know from captured Al-Qaeda communications and from interviewing uh, uh, Al-Qaeda al detainees, that they are instructed to deal 
with Western media in a certain manner, that they are instructed to fabricate tales of torture. Mm -hmm. Now, do I want to be an apologist for torture? No, of course I don't. But we're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious why we are so quick to credit mm -hmm. these stories when, in fact, there's no evidence to suggest that they're true. I, I can't prove to you right now that they're not true. All I can say is that this is what al-Qaeda fighters are told to say. Right. Well, Ron you know? is basically positing that every single person down there in Guantanamo now is an al-Qaeda fighter, and everybody who's claimed any of these uh, sensory deprivation with a bad... They're not, they're the torture is, is really is just I'm, I'm saying substantiated. That question, yeah. Well, whether or not it's true, you know, then why don't we open up the doors? Why won't the government allow lawyers to go down there and inspect? Why won't they allow... But the International allow Red Cross is down there. And, and they they've come inspect. And they've come back and they found... They Amnesty, found no Amnesty, torture. Amnesty International just put out a five-page paper. I just read it uh, last do night they on tor torture? torture in Guantanamo. They absolutely and, and do. And what is the nature of the torture? And, and that uh, they just describe. what I've just described. No, no, I'm, I'm no, not, I would prefer that, that we're not cross-examining. Let me ask you, you know, well, well, whether but, whether the government obeys the law is, of course, a, a question that we all dis always discuss. But taking the law as it is, according to the Military Commissions Act, according to the Military Commissions Act. Cruel and inhuman uh, punishment is, is outlawed, but degrading or humiliating is allowed. Yes. Now, we, that's a good role for the United States to be. Well, in. what I was going to ask you. And humiliating people. Well, that's, I, that's Mark, great. I didn't write the law. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but do you see what's wrong with the law? Well, what that's I was going to ask you. Well, the question I was going to ask you is: suppose, <laughs> suppose you had people who who did who had knowledge. I suppose we were not talking about prosecuting people who had committed a crime. This we're is where about I want to go. This, a crime. Is, this is what now, we're if, not If we're going to prevent, if we, hypothetically, if we could prevent a crime and prevent very serious crimes by, by not torturing, but by degrading, by insulting, by humiliating, would you be opposed to that also? Yes, I don't think that that is the legitimate role of the United States. The legitimate role of the United States Even is to prosecute crimes if a crime is no, no, been committed. No, we're talking about preventing, no. talking about preventing, preventing crimes. Right. Well, I can what, think what of we several should... ways of preventing crimes. Perhaps we shouldn't have a military presence in the middle of Syria so that uh, we are, uh, yeah, we currently have, I think the United States military is currently in something like about 130 different countries. We've had a presence in Korea for 60 years. One wonders, you know, when it, when will that particular war end? I mean, is right. 60 years long enough to be to be there? I All mean, right. President Bush, if you were to be charitable, President Bush has been a great disappointment. He ran in 2000 against things like nation building, I agree. foreign intervention, I agree. all the things that he said Clinton did. All the things I hated Clinton for, Bush was against, and Bush has done every one of them three times as much. Mm -hmm. So nation building is exactly what he said is our legitimate role now in Iraq. Foreign intervention, we don't even want to go there. So if you want to help prevent these people from sending sending their killers over here and blowing up buildings, perhaps one of the things we should do is get out of their country. Yeah, even oh, if we so, Steve, just want to, and then we'll yeah, go on to Yeah, I have to if we just take that as a given. If we take that as a given that if we were if we would not intervene in the rest of the world <clears throat> that we would have less less problems, and people will argue on both sides of that issue. The situation right now is that we have people that are attacking the United States, that we feel um, will attack the United States. And, and the question is, if we can prevent some of those deaths, some of, the, and some of them are very horrendous deaths, by, by perhaps not always obeying the Marquis of Queens, Queensbury rules, by by perhaps embarrassing people a little bit, by humiliating them, but not causing really severe damage. Would you by allowing the ends to justify the means? Not all, not all of, of the ends. Means, so. Well, that's what I was going to ask. That's what, I mean. You Where feel do you that, draw that line? You feel that in no case it should Where do you be. Draw okay. That okay. Line? What do you, Ron? What, some do you have a some of this opinion? discussion is is frivolous. <clears throat> um, if we want to argue against military tribunals on a theoretical basis, that's fine. We can do that. Uh, if we're going to say that military tribunals always devolve into kangaroo courts, uh, we have to look at the Nuremberg trials. We had German war criminals accused of the most heinous crimes against humanity imaginable. They were not packed off and summarily executed. Uh, ten of them did not receive uh, death sentences. They were sentenced uh, from life, life sentences down to much shorter sentences. So the, the men who actually examined the evidence, who cross-examined the accused, 
they took their tasks very seriously. They were not simply hanging judges, although they were faced with the worst criminals the world has known. So we can't just dismiss the idea of a military tribunal by, by mocking it and saying, ah, there, there'll be no justice. You know, people will just be herded off and, uh, you know, the door will slam shut and they'll never see the light of day. That's not true. A military tribunal must be judged by its works. If you have, if you have competent people who are, are, are uh, there to administer justice, that's what you'll get. And there has to be accountability. Now, the subject of preventing, uh, for example, a uh, weapons of mass destruction attack on a major American city. We're, we're talking about an apocalyptic danger here. This is something that we haven't faced in the past. We're talking now, technology has made it possible for a terrorist with a suitcase to do more damage than a fleet of bombers could do in World War II. The only legitimate role of government, and this is something that libertarians should certainly understand, is to protect the citizens. If the government can't provide public safety, we don't need a government. Mark, it's, hypothetically, I, I hypothetically, certainly agree that it is the role of the government no, no, to protect hypothetically, safety. Discussing, discussing Ron's issue here, if it were possible, if, you, if, if there was some reasonable possibility of, protect, of preventing a catastrophe, like the delivery of a, of a weapon of mass destruction by humiliating, uh, uh, by humiliating a prisoner, would, would you be in favor of a one prisoner, say, oh. seven hundred prisoners, seven million prisoners? Well, Where do we draw that line? Why not, and, Ron? Please, yeah. and more importantly, at some point, we while clearly protecting us from invasion from without and insurrection from within is the legitimate function of government. At what point do we say those who surrender their uh, their freedom and their liberty for a little bit of security deserve neither. Okay, well it looks like we have not achieved, we haven't, we've had a very spirited discussion and haven't convinced too many people, but I hope we've, uh, we've gotten our audience uh, a, little, a little steamed up and interested in learning more about libertarianism. And so we'd like to say good night on behalf of New York's premier libertarian show, Hot Fire. Uh, thank you for viewing, and we hope that we'll see you again next week right here. Good night. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.